105, Talk the Talk, Blue Edition. The silence stretched for a few seconds as the giant of a man that was Gilliman loomed over the slightly less gigantic custodes. He was really good at looming, his eyes cold and judging as his presence washed over the room like a tidal wave. Tech priests, mortals, and a few Astartes stumbled, a few of the latter falling to their knees as their primarch's aura brushed against their souls. Unfortunately for him, I barely felt the pressure. Maybe my soul just wasn't susceptible to it or it might have had something to do with the fact that I was far too removed from this drone, merely controlling it through my avatar with long-range telepathy. The custodes similarly ignored it, or if it affected them, they didn't show it. I was happy to note that while only the two custodes actually stepped up to defend me, the rest seemed to respect their stance and aimed their weapons to the side instead of at them. Though they still seemed ready to pounce at a moment's notice. Is that so? The Primarch said, his tone making sure no one truly thought he was asking a question. His gaze shifted to me, and his frown deepened the slightest bit as he saw me standing without a care in the world. I'm willing to hear you out, since it seems these two are willing to vouch for you. I threw a glance at the two gold-clad backs. One was the regular gold armor, with the crimson cloak hanging over it, but the other was royal purple. I felt like that was an important difference. It was important somehow, but for the life of me, I couldn't remember why. No matter, I will find out soon, anyway. I gave a smile to the Primarch and slid past the two golden giants. Everyone was so damn tall, custodes were about one and a half echidnas, and Gilliman was almost twice as tall as me. I could only begrudge myself for taking on a more petite form for this, thinking it might make them let their guard down a bit more if I appeared harmless. I suppose with them having seen my hunter form, that was a long shot. Thankfully, the two custodes didn't try to keep me back as I stepped past them and came face to face with Gilliman. You see, I started, an easy smile on my lips through it all. I was rather curious whether my reward for saving the blood angels from certain death and annihilation was a shadow keeper sent to murder me. I hoped we could have a symbiotic relationship, but then I found out you might have ordered my death, before we even met. There was a shift in the air. The custodes behind me stiffened almost imperceptibly while Gilliman stared at me. I have not ordered the Shadow Keeper to do any such thing, Gilliman said. I believe I even sent a Vox forward to Baal for the Astartes chapters there to secure you. Not that I see why my father's guards seem to think it would be of much use. I glanced at the sword still held in his hands as I thought it over. Was he talking out of his ass? Trying to deny a failed assassination to see where this was going, or is he sincere? He is also right. I haven't given him any reason to accommodate me. He is the acting sovereign of the Imperium and I am just some runaway artifact in his eyes at best, or some upstart Zeno at worst. The cogs are probably already churning in his head, trying to come up with the most efficient way of disposing of me. Let's give him a reason not to. I suppose I should prove why doing such a thing would have been monumentally stupid. The Astartes twitched, their malformed heads glaring at me from behind their jeans sire, while the man himself just raised an eyebrow in what might have been amusement. Are you, threatening me? I am doing no such thing, I said evenly, slumping back as a fluffy chair formed under me. My most valuable commodity is information. Information I know to be worth the most to you in this entire galaxy even. He didn't say anything but he did lower himself back into his command chair as it swirled around behind him. He motioned for me to continue. Let's start with some appetizers to get your attention, I hummed. I wanted some serious compensation for the more valuable little factoids I knew he would love to know, but I had to work up to that. There had to be some trust between us and in my words for that to work. Your fallen brothers are trying to take bites out of you one after the other. I believe Fulgrim and Magnus already gave murdering you a shot, didn't they? That got their attention. No one was supposed to know about the fallen Primarchs, this was probably new information for anyone there than the old hands in the Ultramarines and the Custodes. Gilliman's frown deepened, but he gave me a nod. Mordorion is next, I said. Though he will go about it with a touch more thought put into it than the previous two. I suspected as much, he said. Are you claiming to be a seer? Like that one over there? I inclined my head towards the Eldar, and he nodded slightly. No, what I know is fact. What he knows is a possibility. 
impossible, the Eldar frowned at me. No one can predict the future with certainty. You are one of Eldred's, aren't you? I pierced the man with a stare and he gave me a jerky nod. I gave a soft snort. Thought as much. I am not predicting the future, I am seeing the present and the past. Though with how tangled time is right now, I might as well be seeing the future. And what I'm seeing is a legion of plague marines surrounding Ultramar. I added, that would be hard to prove as of now, said the Primark. Astropathic communication is cut off and even if what you are saying is true, it would take too much time to verify. True, I shrugged as my thoughts swirled. What could I tell him that wasn't much of a loss to give away freely and would make him believe me? Hmm. I tapped my chin. I believe the most valuable information I have for you concerns your brothers, but I am not willing to part with them without compensation. What could you tell me that I don't already know? He gave me a mocking smile. They are either dead or fallen. I just let a sly smile tug at my lips. His smile fell away. Let's start with the fallen ones. What I know of them is hardly something you couldn't pry out of your pet Eldar. I tapped the chair's handrest. Are you interested in any of them in particular? He stared at me for a few seconds again, looming ominously as his blue eyes tried to unravel my soul. Fulgrim. Ah, I nodded. He has been throwing a hissy fit for the last few centuries after one of his loyalist sons blew a virus bomb up in his face. Rylaner, I believe his name was, waited thousands of years to clobber together the bomb on Istvan III and lured Fulgrim to himself. He tried to corrupt the dreadnought, but all he got was a virus bomb to the face for his troubles, his pride hasn't been the same since. That was a nice little short story I remembered clearly. The arrogant snake getting shown up was glorious, maybe I could needle him about it if we ever run into each other. What else though? He barely does anything other than play around on his planet, I said with a thoughtful frown. And he is probably the weakest right now after Lorger, maybe somewhere a bit below Magnus. Is there proof of this? He asked after a moment, maybe waiting to see whether I'd cough up anything else. All the witnesses for this aside from Fulgrim are dead, he'd probably die of shame if they weren't, I shrugged, then gave him a feral grin. Though if you mention it to him whenever he comes for you, I'm sure you will have all the proof you need. Now then, who next? We went over all the fallen permarks like that with Gilliman's frown continuing to deepen as a pensive look entered his eyes. I could tell he was looking at something, there was a blue glint in his eyes so I supposed he was reading up on some reports to verify what he could. Though, maybe he was doing that through some communication device with a scribe. The damned scribes were walking libraries, their minds are a mess of so much tangled information that I could barely get anything useful out of the mind of the single one I managed to mind dive. In the end, we managed to reach the part where I drew the line. I'm afraid that's as much as you are going to get without compensation. While we are at it, you might as well enlighten me about how much part you had to play in the attacks I've had to endure over the past few days. He narrowed his eyes at me. I barely gave him anything more than basic information that he couldn't get from the database or random factoids, but he should know that I know much more than I should by now. I could have you seized, he said evenly. And have a psyker pry that information out of your mind. You could try, I said, a flicker of anger surging in my heart. All that would earn you is a localized explosion, sending your command deck into the void. Sure, you would survive, but that would mean you made an enemy where you could have made an ally. I turned my head, ignoring the frown he was throwing me, and looked at the custode standing a step behind me, the one with the red cloak. You know what I am, don't you? That shadowkeeper seemed to know much about me, and now you come claiming I am your charge? Yes, he said after a moment. Our mission was to protect you. Forgive me for intruding on your conversation but are you in any danger from the Shadow Keeper? I raised an eyebrow. Not the one on Ball. He is busy trying to survive the plague I shoved up his ass, so I'm not too worried about him. He had a nasty spear, though. How eloquent. Well done, me. I thought, but couldn't bother with looking too cordial. Gilliman was being a pain. Anyway, I cleared my throat. Could you enlighten him about what I am, so he finally realizes how silly and worthless his threats are? 
Dad earned a deep, questioning stare from the Primarch, but it quickly jumped up to the custodes that talked to me. I believe that is heavily restricted information. Of course it is. I rolled my eyes. The gist of it is that I am piloting this body through a telepathic connection from half a system away, and if you do something silly, like trying to attack me, I am blowing it up so hard you will be washing the fried pieces of your men's guts out of your hair for the next decade. Some of the Astartes seemed to be frothing, but the custodes didn't show any sign of even having heard me. They could probably sense that I didn't have anywhere close enough power in this form to hurt them. I could send all of their asses onto a spacewalk though. Worthless threats, Gilliman said. You said you came here to talk, but I hardly heard anything other than threats and information I could have gotten anywhere else. I am not giving free information away. I rolled my eyes. And the only reason I am here after not only having a shadow keeper try to murder me, but even the blood angels turned on me the moment your orders arrived on ball, is to see whether I should cut my losses here. Gilliman's gaze momentarily flashed to one of the tech priests. Verify that. A moment later, something flashed in his eyes, and his earpiece buzzed to life. I could hear the monotonic voice of a coghead even though I wasn't meant to. They reported having attempted apprehending the creature suspected to be the one you described, but it broke through them with little effort. They failed. Gilliman hummed at the answer. Having your men beat someone's girlfriend black and blue and threaten her life isn't how you make allies, I said as he thought. After another back and forth with the tech priest as Gilliman's mouthpiece, his frown deepened. It seems we started off on the wrong foot, he said. So it would seem, I said. I broke into your ship and left some lobotomized void men behind, and the only reason I survived your misunderstood orders was because Dante's men were too weak to enforce them. They wouldn't have killed you, he amended. The part about your survival was strictly stated in the order. But my partner's wasn't, I said but I am willing to let it be water under the bridge. I even refrained from slaughtering Dante and his men for their betrayal as a sort of olive branch for you. You wanted to talk, he said after a moment. Stubbornly refusing to apologize or even acknowledge having been an ass. Oh well, works for me. Talk, and we will see where this goes. 106, so much negotiating. I am still at the place where I have a bunch of information that would be invaluable to you but I'm not willing to part with without compensation. Telling me how the rest of my brothers died would hardly be invaluable. It would only take reading up on old reports. I shrugged. You would find that those reports are spotty at best. One disappeared and left only a hand behind on a battlefield. Another is slumbering like a corpse somewhere. They are dead, he said, a simmering fury behind his eyes. Consider your words carefully. I won't allow you to despoil their memory. He almost growled, but caught himself. I'm hardly doing anything of the sort, I shrugged. If I was about to do that, I wouldn't even be here. Do you know what the main thing I want from you is? He inclined his head, which I took as a prompt to continue. A lock of your hair, I smiled. A single sample of a primark is genetic material. You aren't the only source I have, and you aren't even the easiest one. It only took him a moment to connect the dots and catch on to what I was implying. To be honest, grave robbing Sanguinius would have been the easier option, but his genes were all sorts of fucked up. I didn't want the black rage in my head if I could help it. My mind was a chaotic mess as it was already. I didn't want to complicate it even further. Gilliman didn't need to know that, though. As far as he knew, I was going to dig up his dead brother's corpse to take a nibble out of him if our talk fell through here. His sword roared to life with a golden fire that set my danger sense on edge. My soul isn't in this drone, I said with more confidence than I felt. That stupid sword could rend the souls of demons apart. I wasn't sure if I wanted it touching me, even if it was just through a drone. Still, my danger sense only informed me that the sword was rather sharp and burning. It was far from the holy shit you're going to die warning it gave me when the shadow keeper aimed his spear at me. Running me through will not only cut our negotiations short, but burn any bridge that exists or could exist between us. After holding my bored gaze for a few seconds, the flames disappeared with a hiss. That is a tall ask, he said, his voice devoid of emotion. 
I know little of you, but even that tells me that handing you a sample of my genes would be the same as giving you a weapon of war that hasn't been seen since the Great Crusade. We can work up to it, I grinned. There are many things I want, a bit of you is just the most important one. Do you have a blank on this ship? I do, he answered. I will give you a package deal then, I said. Everything I know about Lorger and the Raven Lord for a nibble of that blank. What do you say? He thought for only a moment. Blanks were rare as hell, but not that rare. With the abilities I already showed it was only a matter of time before I tracked one down and got a bite out of M. He might as well profit off of handing me an easy meal that I would have gotten, anyway. That is what I hope he is thinking at least, if I can beat that into his head, he should give me some of his blood too by the time he hears some of the things I know. Primarch gene samples aren't quite as hard to get as he might think and even if I don't dig up Sanguinius' grave, there are others. Bring him here, he said. His eyes narrowed. Don't kill him. Without a word, a pair of Astartes set off, supposedly to get the man. I just want a nibble, I said. He'll live. While we are at it, don't bring him too close to me, or the connection with this drone might snap. A lock of hair or a bit of blood will do. I saw the calculative look that entered his eyes, thinking he found my weakness. In a way, he did. Unfortunately, I was aware of it, so I made sure anyone trying to make use of it would have to pay a price. I should probably warn the guy that I'm blowing up if he gets too close. A minute passed in uncomfortable silence. Gilliman wasn't one for small talk it seemed and the custodes acted like living statues with the rest trying to make sure they had one of the transhumans between themselves and me. I took a moment to send my awareness out from my main body along with some stealthy flyer drones. Nothing fancy, just some birds with just enough energy to fly fast enough to circle around Dante's fortress. Getting my door kicked down while I was mid-negotiation would have been annoying. I also noted that Zedev was fiddling with some old tech in the building we were squatting in while Valanith was sitting up on top of it. The Eldar brimmed with eagerness, and I didn't doubt for a moment that he'd pounce on the first thing he could reasonably call a threat with glee. He might have gotten the slightest bit unhinged if that's how all Eldar would react to being yanked into my puddle, I wasn't sure I wanted to do that too much. I already had two of them. Almost forgot about Faye and her little boy toy. Hmm, I wonder what decision they came to. It could be fun to have more people to travel with. The heavy clang of armored footsteps signaled the return of the two Astartes, and as they stepped into the room, an unassuming man dressed in simple clothes I've seen on hundreds of serfs on my way up. I could already feel my connection fraying even though he was around 20 meters away from me. He must be quite powerful. Still, his null field might as well be a cold breeze, compared to the deadly blizzard of the black skull the shadow keeper was lugging around. You should stop there, I said softly, and thankfully he obeyed even though he didn't know me. It was easy to assume that anyone who dared give orders with Gilliman around was important. We wouldn't want my failsafes to activate, just because my control over this drone snapped. Here he is, said Gilliman. You will be allowed to do what you were promised once you have given me that information. I narrowed my eyes at him, then cast a glance around. A dozen custodes, more Astartes, and a fair amount of tech priests, with even a few normal human officers here and their sweating buckets. You sure? I asked. I was of the mind that even saying that there are more than eight primarchs was a recipe for getting roasted by lost fire. I will worry about that myself, he said. Speak. Oh well, whatever, I shrugged, leaning back into my chair. I was technically both the chair and the body sitting on it, but thinking about it like that would make things weird. Lorger only led a few little incursions since the heresy, taking some fringe worlds here and there and sometimes supporting Abaddon's escapades. He couldn't do anything too big since the Raven Lord spent every living moment since the heresy hounding him. Corvus, he muttered, disbelief clear on his face. You are claiming he is alive? In a sense, I said. He, is probably far from the brother you knew once. The reports I have say he left for the Eye of Terror shortly after the heresy, never to be seen again. Ah, he doesn't believe me. Of course he wouldn't, I could hear it in his voice. Why would one of his loyalist brothers leave the Imperium to rot, after all? 
It was illogical and hard to understand for a man of duty and honor like Gilliman, and they are correct, I shrugged. What I know is that several demon worlds of the word bearers fell at his hands. Somewhere along the way, the powers of the warp changed him. If not in mind, then in form. Explain. You were all special, you know? I said, looking him over. There were many attempts to clone Primarchs, but almost all of them failed. Not because they couldn't replicate your bodies, but because your bodies are just vessels. They aren't what makes you special. You can have that bit of tidbit as a freebie, since I'm feeling generous. That's all? he asked, feigning indifference with some measure of success. Yes, that's all I know concerning those two. I rolled my eyes. You barely paid for it, so you shouldn't have expected anything more. Now. I'd appreciate not getting shot for taking my price? He waved his hand but made no other motion. I held back the urge to roll my eyes again. Stupid power play. He wanted to see how I'd take a nibble out of the trembling blank if getting close to him hurts me. I slowly lifted a hand, palm up and let a single tendril slip through my skin and detach from it. From then on, I had no control over the little thing and it followed only pre-programmed commands. It was an easy sidestepping of the issue. If there was no psychic connection to disrupt, the blank was basically just a weak human, and I had no trouble killing those even without my psychic might. The tendril twisted around itself, shifting from white mass to flesh and blood around normal bones. In just a few seconds, a tiny white dove sat in my palm, staring up at me with beady black eyes. Then it swung its wings and flew into the air. Barely a moment later, it landed silently on the blank's shoulder, its clawed feet easily piercing through his clothes and skin, tasting and absorbing just a bit of blood. Before the man could even yelp in pain, the dove was back in my palm. I patted its fluffy little head, then let it unmake itself into tendrils and sink back into my body. Helpful little thing, a bit of a safety hazard, with me not being able to constantly monitor whether something had gotten its grabby claws on some of my eldritch flesh, but it has its uses. I'm done, I said, returning my gaze to Gilliman. Take him away, he said to the Astartes. Check him over. I have more interesting stuff for you, some of it much better than what I just gave you, but I wonder whether you can give me something worthwhile for it. I hummed. The last one will cost you a lock of your hair for sure, though. But we can negotiate on the other. Just two, he frowned. I know something worthwhile of only two more people you might be interested in, I shrugged. But we can make it a package deal, and I'll tell you all I know about the rest of your brothers. No promises about you learning anything new though. What would you ask for? That doesn't involve me giving you my hair? Hmm, I thought. I don't suppose you have a genetic library on this ship? Or on one of the Mechanicus vessels in your fleet? I might, he acknowledged. Are you looking for anything specific? Just some interesting wildlife from death worlds, I said. Though I would prefer stuff from Catacan. They have the most curious things there. And no, I won't be satisfied with just one or two samples, I think what I'm going to tell you is worth the loss of a little genetic library. You think? he asked. How can I be sure of that? Gamble a bit, I shrugged. I am well aware how much you must want to believe you aren't alone to guide this rotting carcass of an empire back on its tracks. I am offering you hope. Real hope. Not the sham I just sold you that one of your brothers, consumed by vengeance, is running around like a space horror. Shit, why can't I keep my mouth shut? This isn't how one should be negotiating. Stupid. I didn't let any of that show on my face. Might as well roll with the arrogant alien thing I have going on. It's just, being myself, after all. Ugh. So be it, he said after almost a minute of staring at my face like he was trying to drill a hole in my brain with his gaze and see what it's made of. First the information, then you can have a library of genetic samples. How do I know you won't be giving me a library of random grasses or something? You don't, he said. Throwing my own words back at me, I rolled my eyes. So be it. But that will be the end of negotiations for today. We can start with the last one once I have that library. 
Agreed, he said, a bit too quickly for my liking. Hmm, is he trying to figure me out? Giving himself more time to study me and figure out what makes me tick. Well, I don't mind. Could be fun. I might even get a bite out of whatever is hiding down under Ball when he inevitably goes to beat it up. Now, which to tell him, I wonder. It was either the return of the lion or the name and goals of the king in yellow. I think I'll go with the lion. That seems like the less important information, he is just going around beating up bad guys while the other is out there scheming in his personal pocket dimension with a fuck-off huge army. Yep. The lion is alive, I said, deciding not to beat around the bush. Alive and well, if a bit grumpy. How? Gilliman asked in a whisper, and the silence on the command deck seemed to grow even louder. He never died, I said. I don't know what your report said about him, but after the fall of Caliban, he fell into a coma from his wounds. I'm not sure why, but he never woke up from it up until now, or in the next few years. Time is a bit of a tangled mess right now. He'll just, wake up, he asked, an eyebrow raised in disbelief. Personally, I believe those little aliens he kept around were keeping him asleep until he was needed. Not that it matters. He is going to be needed. Gilliman leaned back, his carefully kept stoic expression crumbling for but a single fragment of a second. Then he was back to his statue-like self. Anything else? How can I find him, if what you are telling me is the truth at all? I think it would be much easier to wait until he finds you, I said, rubbing my chin in thought. Like Corvus, he isn't quite the same man you knew, though to a far lesser extent. Primarily, he has a strange ability that lets him teleport through interstellar distances. Seeing the look he's got on his face, I just shrugged. Don't believe me, if you don't want to. But you will waste far too much time trying to track him down, especially since he will primarily operate on this side of the Great Rift. And he could make these teleports even with the warp being as it is? This ability isn't the equivalent of a warp jump, I said. More like a personal webway connected right to his soul, one where he can enter and exit the subspace wherever and whenever he wishes. He gave me a nod, though I could feel he was not going to believe a single word that left my lips until he had confirmation. Hmm, maybe he was a bit more disturbed than I'd thought, letting those feelings radiate through his aura. Whatever. I have all that I wanted from this. Getting a genetic sample from him was a stretch, I know there is a gene library so I can rob it blind without his help if he doesn't pull through, and the lion would be even easier to pay off for a lock of hair than Gilliman if that final trade fell through. Okay. Goals updated, get the gene library, bite the super swarm lord if possible, and maybe get a lock of Gilliman's hair. Giving myself a mental nod, I stood up. No matter what I implied, I really didn't want sanguineous genes anywhere inside my body, so the great angel was safe from grave robbing. Maybe if Dante was less of an asshole, I might have even attempted to shove the parts of his soul back together and stitch them to his corpse, but fuck him. The room tensed, and I gave them a grin. Pleasure doing business with you, I said. We will meet once you make planet fall, I will collect my price then. Until then, farewell. All the eldritch flesh in my body immolated, burning bioenergy at just the right temperature to turn my drone into ash instead of combusting it. Giving myself a mental pat on the back for the cool exit, I pulled the telepathic link back. Waste not, want not. No need to let all that soul energy dissipate into the void. It almost slapped me in the face like a snapped rubber band, but I managed to slow it just in time. All right. That went better than I feared and worse than I hoped. No plant survives first contact with the blue giant, after all. I think I did well, for this being my second ever negotiation. Yep. One step at a time. This was a large step, but I'm still on the bottom of the stairs. Many more steps are to come. Achievement unlocked, very poetic. You can write metaphors just as well as a fourth grader. Oh, shut up. 107 Hardship and Struggles All Around. Robot Gilliman. He watched as the body, not unlike that of a young woman, flaked away into a cloud of ash that slowly gathered into a pile on the floor. Nobody spoke, though he assumed their thoughts were just as loud as his own. There were many things in the darker reaches of this galaxy no human could ever understand, 
not even one enhanced to such a degree as himself. Whatever just happened was far from the strangest thing that had happened in his life, it wasn't even the strangest since he awoke from his stasis. His meeting with the, being that was his father, once took that spot easily. Octavian, he said, sending a minute jolt through the custodes as he removed his gaze from the pile of ash and met Gilliman's gaze. I want to know everything you can tell me about that thing. Dot. To be honest with himself, the primary feeling left in his heart in the aftermath of his meeting with the Zeno was worry, mixed with a trace amount of treacherous hope. The creature somehow knew where exactly to plunge her metaphorical knife. The fact it knew the worry he hid in the depths of his heart so far was by itself eerie, and he would have loved to ignore its little power play. Unfortunately, it was right. He suspected the Zeno knew even before coming here that he wouldn't be able to give up on somehow getting even a single one of his brothers back. The creature figured out just the spot where it hurt the most, he would never know, but it had and it was right. He loathed every day of trying to guide this mutated, rotting carcass of an empire back into order as it did its very best to tear itself apart from within while the scavengers already gathered to feast on it. Again and again, he wished for any of his brothers to come back, to let him share his burden with them or at least have a single other being in the entire galaxy who might be able to understand him. Hope was a poison, he knew, but it was a delicious one and he drank it down like a starving man. If there was even the slightest little figment of truth to any of the claims the Zeno made, he had to get to the bottom of it. What worried him though, was that so far he gave nothing. True, the information was unconfirmed, but in essence, the alien just waltzed up to him and gave him free information. The gene library, if she ever got around to claiming it, was entirely replaceable and almost worthless in his eyes and the pariah was as good as new if the medic's reports were right. He didn't understand his foe. That was his problem. He hadn't the faintest clue how much the things he thought worthless and gave up with little resistance were worth to her. Conveniently, before him stood just the man who could tell him everything he wanted to know. If only he wasn't so tight-lipped. It is under the highest level of confidentiality, Lord Regent. There was just the faintest trace of uncertainty in his voice. Gilliman understood. The Zeno obviously didn't share Octavian's dogmatic attachment to secrecy, and probably the only reason she never gave a full breakdown of what she was just because he hadn't asked. He knew the game more than well enough to refrain from doing so. She gave information for free, but if he showed interest, she would have asked for compensation and would have been in a position to ask for much more than any other way. Your mission is to protect that creature if I remember correctly? Not that he thought his memory would decide to fail him for the first time in his life. Yes, Octavian said. That is correct. The biggest threat on the Zeno's life at the moment is me deciding that her continued survival is a threat to the Imperium, is that not so? Perhaps it is, Octavian allowed. If one doesn't factor in the unknown and the danger the Shadow Keepers represent. Perhaps if I knew more of this Zeno, I could be convinced that cooperation is preferable to eliminating it, Gilliman said. Though if you were to keep your silence, I might just assume that is in accordance with your mission. That me knowing that information you withhold would only persuade me to terminate the threat the Zeno poses. I believe it would be prudent to act with that assumption in mind, if that was the case, wouldn't it? Threatening a custode, as he was doing right now might be a dangerous gambit, but he was more than willing to take it. Octavian and the Aquilian shield next to him were tense, coiled like springs, and the other golden warriors also showed readiness for combat, though who would they aid if a fight really did break out, he couldn't know. Then Octavian gave the slightest of nods, and Gilliman allowed himself a minute smile. From the conversation he had with it, he understood that the Zeno had an understanding of his character and the things he values, it knew of things that were long forgotten, he had to even the scales as much as possible before their next meeting he didn't have long. Ball was already clearly visible through the viewing panels. With that in mind, Gilliman listened with rapt attention as Octavian began to speak. Come on, you can do it. Okay. Three. Two. One, move. After psyching myself up for a good minute inside the confines of my head, I finally managed to gather the resolve to do what had to be done. It might have been the hardest thing I've ever done, easily up there with my fight with the Shadow Keeper. A single glance at Celine's adorably drooling at my shoulder almost shattered that resolve, but I was made of sterner stuff than that. 
I think. Hey, I nudged her softly. We need to get up. She just groaned, scrunching up her eyebrows and flopping around to her other side, which unfortunately meant she was no longer stuck to my side like a koala. I used the opportunity to slip out from under the blanket and hop over to the other side and give her a poke. Then another, and another in all the tickly spots I discovered yesterday. Oh, damn it stop, she yelled, half crying, half laughing as I gave her naked side a final pinch. You are evil. I puffed myself up at the compliment, which earned me a pillow to the face. Coffee? I asked, putting the pillow back on the bed with a simple under Celine's glare. What? she asked. Um, I frowned. Recaf? That's what you call it, right? Yeah, she frowned back, squinting at me suspiciously. The one you make out of xeno-organic fluids? No? I'm good, I think, she huffed, slipping out of the bed with a scowl of one deprived of their morning intake of caffeine. Then she gave me a hopeful look. Can you do that pick-me-up thingy with your space magic? Sure, I grinned, then poked her in the side again, which made her let out an adorable yelp as bioenergy rushed into her body and banished any semblance of fatigue. We should get dressed if you are in such a hurry, she grumbled, but the tired scowl was gone from her face as she gave her body a look over. She was certainly the more enthusiastic out of the two of us yesterday, but she was still left with the marks of our lovemaking. It was beautiful, especially with her disheveled hair to go with it. We probably should. I gave a faux sigh as I conjured up my regular set of silken pants and, toga? No, that was that flowy Roman clothing. This was more of a long shirt split at the sides, and held together by a sash at my waist. It was simplicity itself, but I loved how the materials felt against my skin and the fact that it didn't limit my range of movement one bit. Such a shame. On that, we agree, she gave my clothed form a regretful look. Just for her, I refrained from healing away the marks she left on me, and there were a lot. Celine was the sort that was surprisingly brazen once she let herself go. The fleet's here? Yep, I said. Already in low orbit. The Thunderhawks are descending as we speak with the big blue man himself in one of them. Hmm, she frowned as she finished pulling on her pants, putting on her own set of the same clothing I had on, just in black. Will that really be all right? Primarchas are supposed to be a league above custodian guards, and a single one of those almost did you in. If that shadow keeper didn't have the exact combination of arcane toys that he had, I would have slaughtered him in a minute, I shrugged. But you are right, Gilliman has toys of his own that I should keep my distance from. Though unless he pulls out a blank on the level of that black skull, he wouldn't have much of a chance at doing me any permanent damage. If you are sure, she squinted at me. You aren't even back to full capacity yet, are you though? I should be in a few hours, I grimaced as I felt around the hair-thin cracks crisscrossing an entire half of my mindscape. I'll be careful, and so will you. I have no idea whether I can save you if you get yourself impaled on his flaming word. That thing can obliterate souls. Maybe you should go alone, she said thoughtfully. If it comes down to a fight, we'll just be baggage. There was a resolve in the way her eyes narrowed as she said that. A promise that she would change that fact. I smiled at her. It shouldn't come to that. I had a little talk with him and I think he'll err on the side of caution and aim for diplomacy, at least for now. When, she massaged her head as if nursing a headache. Did you run off to talk with the regent lord of the Imperium while cuddling? Yep, I nodded. Sorry. Why are you sorry? Should have given my entire focus to cuddling. She rolled her eyes, but not without a smirk tugging at her lips. Let's get the other two, or do you want to leave them? If you want to be there when the Thunderhawks land, we only have a few minutes. I think Valineth should come. I rubbed my chin. Gilliman has one of Eldred's other stray apprentices, tagging along with him. I'm curious what'll happen when they meet. All right, she nodded, emotion draining out of her face as her back straightened. She had no obvious weapons on her, but the harlequin's kiss glinted on her left wrist and the white choker on her neck would unfurl into the best combat armor I could make for her, along with a small arsenal of weapons. I'm ready. 
Dal, I tightened the telepathic connection between me and the Eldar. We are going to meet the newcomers. Come. Let us go then, I grinned. A portal hissed and tore through space, showing a very surprised and unfortunate human in a ragged PDF uniform on the other side. The moment I felt space warp a bit behind me as Balanitha's familiar aura spread out of it, I stepped through. This is going to be fun. As an afterthought, I sent a summary of all the stuff that happened and where we were going to Zedev, along with a request to continue fortifying the place without committing too much of his resources. The poor Muggos was the only one of us who I didn't make semi-immortal, so he would be staying behind. I sent a bolt of psychic power after the human now scrambling away, wiping his short-term memory and putting him to sleep. No need to have everyone up in arms just for little old me. Well, there was no need at this time. I didn't plan on attacking them, plus the surprise would be ruined if Dante knew I was here. I hope Mephiston wasn't a killjoy. 108 work, work, work. I easily hid ourselves from most prying eyes, to be honest, only Mephiston would have been able to notice me, or maybe if Gilliman's ultra instincts somehow activated and alerted him of my presence. None of the above mentioned happened. There was no sign of Mephiston, and Gilliman showed no sign of knowing that we were looking at the proceedings down below as he disembarked from his Thunderhawk. His was about the tenth of the things, nine previous ones having vomited out a crap ton of blueberry boys who were now rushing about to reinforce the lacking guards and security on the fortress outer walls, while an honorary guard remained behind as they watched Dante greet the Primarch. Well, more like he was breaking down and fell to his knees before him. The scene before me was eerily similar to what I remembered from The Devastation of Bald Book. That was one of the few I actually read from start to finish and only a short while before I kicked the bucket so it was relatively clear in my memory. The one stark difference was that Dante didn't have half his guts missing and wasn't a step away from greeting his jean sire as he knelt before Gilliman. My actions had consequences, for better or for worse. Though it seemed fate might be flexing its might a bit, so only minor discrepancies happened. If that were true, fate might be clamping down hard on butterfly effects, but if I could change small things, I could change the big ones too with enough effort and power. It was a relieving thought. Get up, Dante, said Gilliman. I will not accept displays of humility from a man like you. You are one of the few in this era who have earned the right to speak to me on equal terms. Rise. Now. The deja vu was strong with this one. I watched on as they did some bonding or whatnot, with Gilliman attempting to make the chapter master believe he was in fact, alive, real, and yes, he wasn't a dream. Let us continue further discussions in your command room, said Gilliman. Finally. I have the written reports, but hearing it from your mouth would be best. As you wish, my lord. I barely suppressed a sigh. Finally, they were moving. Now, we can do some more talking. Joy. Somehow, I wasn't all too thrilled about it, maybe because I knew today was just a setup for later, at least for me. There wouldn't be much of a prize to be earned in these talks, I was just clarifying that I would not be easy to get rid of and cement myself as a semi-permanent part of this little camp. The idea in my head was that later down the line, when we fought together for a bit, Gilliman would be more pliable to the idea of handing me a bit of his genetic sample knowing I wasn't an entirely insane alien. Plus, to be honest, being antagonistic with the Lord Regent and having to fend off the instruments of his ire, assassins or even crusade fleets, when I managed to settle down somewhere and start my little empire project would be a colossal pain in the ass. Better that he thought of me as a possible long-term ally or at least a useful one to be kept alive should he need my help later on. Let's just hope it goes better this time. I messed it up with Dante, but maybe Gilliman will be more level-headed. With a snap, we blinked over to the almost empty secondary command room that I knew they would be using. Hmm, this was more like a strategic center with a giant map in the middle along with large data slates showing information on whatever might be needed. The room only had two tech priests busying themselves by running some final checkups on the machinery before the important people arrived. I plopped down into a chair, Celine and Val taking up positions behind me like guards. That was good for now, though I didn't really like the idea of making Celine subordinate to me, but for now, it was, ideal. Well, ideal to the image, I wanted to show the Imperials, and my little minx knew that. 
My instincts tingled an alarm as warp energy twisted for the briefest moment before the towering form of Mephiston snapped into being with a hiss of displaced air in the other end of the room. What are you doing here? The tech priests almost jumped in terror and with a mental shrug, I dismissed my illusion. Meanwhile, I tried to memorize the ways the warp energy twisted before he arrived. Mephiston didn't use blink or any similar teleportation. He just walked in here so fast it seemed like teleportation. Nice of you to join us, I gave him a smile that didn't quite reach my eyes. Take a seat, let's wait for the rest to arrive. I could see his inner debate on his weathered face, but I was relieved to have guessed correctly when the old librarian gave a minute nod. He didn't have any warp energy readied, which was the equivalent of having his blade sheathed for a psyker. I guessed correctly that he didn't want to fight. I mimicked the gesture, not drawing on my energy and making sure neither did neither of my companions. Especially since Mephiston's gaze was lingering on Valeneth. I held back a smile. My psychic might was supposedly hard to measure since my soul wasn't in my body, one had to sort of reverse guess exactly how strong I might have been from my feats of strength. There was no such problem with Val, the Eldar was bursting at the seams with power, reveling in the freedom to let his soul bubble and churn without any fear of a thirsty demon god chomping down on him. Humans might have thought Eldar to be manageable before, but they'd never met an Eldar that didn't have to hold back 99% of their strength. Though if there was one person in the Imperium who'd still managed to wipe the floor with Val, it'd be Mephiston. Mephiston was a menace in combat, I still did not know how he slowed time around him to a crawl with the measly amount of warp energy, well, measly compared to what I could bring to bear, he used to achieve it. Or did he speed up his own time? Like one of those haste spells? Even if I knew how he was doing it, I couldn't quite replicate it. I could make myself go faster, but not to the level where everything else around me seemed frozen in time. I didn't get how he didn't just immolate everything around him from the friction on even just the air, or how he didn't break himself into a million pieces with every move. I'd have to watch as he does his thing, maybe with my entire focus on him, and with near-infinite time to review the footage, I could stumble upon something. Or my mind cores would, if not me. There were always new tricks and tools to add to my arsenal. I couldn't allow myself to become complacent with fucking gods being real in this galaxy. I needed enough firepower to make Tan S, and those warp fuckers tremble. That would not be any time soon, though. For now, I needed enough power to protect myself and this motley little crew I somehow gathered around myself. I shook that thought away. I was working towards that right now, having the genetic template of a pre-march would go a long way towards that goal. Even if their greatest strength didn't come from their biological bodies, Primarchs were the best bioengineered super soldiers in this galaxy. I gave a glance to my two companions and a minute nudge. They straightened even further, if that was possible. And then the door screeched open on cogs and machinery that could have used all that oil the duo of tech priests squirted all over the keyboards in the room. First came Dante with two of his men flanking him, all of whom froze and pointed weapons. How rude. I refrained from ripping the bolters out of their hands, mostly because I noticed Mephiston visibly tensing. He didn't pull on the warp just yet, but he was ready to do so in a moment. I just tilted my head at them and smiled. I had nothing witty come to mind, but watching the interesting cavalcade of emotions on Dante's face as a large blue hand came to rest on his shoulder was a better use of my focus, anyway. Fingers left the triggers, and the barrels lowered as a heavy stare bore into me. We meet again. The Primarch's voice ran through the blood angels like a jolt, even Mephiston looking the slightest bit shocked as he tore his gaze away from our group to look at Gilliman. Dante was much worse, his face twisted into something indescribable for a moment, before he wiped it of any emotion. Yes, yes, I met your big bad boss, and he didn't let you shoot me on sight, despite knowing I beat you up and killed some of your men. That we do, I said with a smile, rising from my chair the one just to the left of the one titanic chair probably hastily clobbered together to fit the Primarch's large, frame. He nodded as if me being here was a matter of course and strode to the chair obviously made for him. His commanding stare washed over the rest of the people, lingering on my two companions and Mephiston. We have much to discuss. Take your seats. I readied myself for the most boring meeting of my life and wasn't disappointed. 
Gilliman only seemed to care about dangers on the planet and quickly got to working out a plan to eliminate any major threat on Ball. He still had thousands of planets and systems to liberate on his crusade, Ball was just one of the many stops for him and he wanted issues brought forward and solutions made as quickly as possible. My only input was once again relaying what I'd found down in the caverns and giving Gilliman an eye on the strange creature that ripped my drone apart. I was sure he kept an eye on me and would grill everyone on what they knew of me and the two people I brought along with me later, but he made no move of his own yet. He seemed satisfied with just strategizing and planning for now. Dowell and Gilliman's pet farcer were locked in a staring contest for the entirety of the meeting and Celine made a convincing portrayal of a statue. Meanwhile, I only had a little part of my mind dedicated to following the mind-numbing meeting as I entertained myself by redesigning my mindscape a bit. It was, a bit hectic. Back when I first visualized it, I only had a handful of mind cores so it worked. One central pyramid floating in the void with half a dozen lesser pyramids orbiting it, connected to it, and to each other, by streams of energy. Now though, the central pyramid, which was my conscious main mind, formed a tiny core at the center of a disparate cloud of lesser pyramids, which all connected to every other pyramid. Looking out from the top of the big one, I couldn't see an end to them. They extended so far into the void and were packed so densely that I couldn't even see the void from them. It was a mess, in short, and my paranoia of my mind core somehow working together to overwhelm my psyche was getting louder and louder with each new mind core joining the rest. Firstly, I created partitions. I had rudimentary ones already, but these were just designations, and the mind core still made up a single unified web instead of separate ones. I fixed that first. Secondly, I funneled more power into the central node of my mind, basically growing the main pyramid in size a hundredfold. Hopefully, that wouldn't mess with my thought process too much. Losing myself was one of my biggest fears, so I refrained from a larger enhancement for now. Hopefully, being able to think faster and of more things at once wouldn't mess with me too much. If it didn't work out, I'd have to look into creating basically lobotomized mind cores filled to the brim with mental power to use as cudgels should any of my mind cores decide to be rebellious. I always loathed stories where the hero had a demon, alternate personality, or some old cultivator stuck perpetually in their head who was fucking obviously trying to steal their body. I'm not having that shit in my head. You hear, little shits? You better behave. Either way, aside from soothing my paranoia, partitioning them into separate groups should make them more efficient in accomplishing their tasks. If they need to communicate with other groups, I could make dedicated communication relays between them. I need to learn more about these things. I'm sure there is a better way for this. These things are basically AI, even if biological in origin, relying on my instincts will only take me so far. But who the hell can even help with these things? In the meantime, the meeting came to an end and Gilliman graciously offered to have us stay in the fortress, an offer which I refused with a gracious smile. However, I decided that a line of communication was a must-have between us, so I quickly came up with a solution. I was graced with the sight of Gilliman staring down at a fluffy ball of fur I'd placed in his hand with what I'd assumed was apprehension on his face. Squish it, he asked with a serious frown on his features as he turned the thing around. Squish it, try it, I said. He did so, and the thing deformed in his hands, like one of those gelatinous squish balls from back home. More importantly, it sent me a telepathic message. I am being squished. It sent to a newly created tiny mind core dedicated just to this. The thing was about as smart as two rocks, but that didn't mean it couldn't run a single if, squished, then, send message, program continuously. How do I know it works, he asked, staring at the thing like it was the greatest mystery of the universe. I can trace the telepathic message it sends back to the source and connect to it and through it to you. Which would you prefer? You can speak through this thing, he asked, and I shrugged. I can modify it to be able to. Though it won't work if you or I head off-world. Please do so, he said. I did just that. I could understand not wanting unknown aliens to connect to your mind. We ee, -e, I'm being squished. The thing squealed after a moment and I removed my finger from it with a studiously neutral expression on my face. It works, I said. It does indeed, he agreed. Well, that's it then, goodbye for now. 
I'll find you in a few days for that promised genetic library and please do call me when you plan to see what that thing hiding in the caverns is. I'd love to help with that. I'll see to it that the library is ready to receive you, he said. Farewell. I smiled and nodded at him. Then teleported us back to our impromptu base. Well, that's that, I shrugged. What do you think? Master Eldred will have questions, said Val. I kept up appearances ever since you've freed me, but I've been, sparse. Especially in details, and I might have failed to actually mention having been freed. He will know. And soon. That farcer tailing Gilliman was one of his apprentices, right? Indeed, Val said with a slight grimace. He'll rush to report to him, I'm sure. Will Eldred be a problem? I, don't believe so, but you can never know what his true goals are. He has plans within plans within plans, and I don't even know if he himself, can keep track of them. Hmm, I shrugged. We'll deal with it when it comes down to it, I'm not annoying a craft world if I don't have to, and we have enough problems on our plate already. Celine, how was meeting a pre-march? Strange, she said thoughtfully, her stoic expression melting as she relaxed. I thought I'd feel, something. I don't even feel the usual terror when looking at an Astartes anymore. I don't know what I expected, but it was not, him. Great, I grinned. I wasn't done with the template I was working on for her, but I'd made some minor adjustments and one of them was wiping away the instinctual terror transhuman put into regular humans. Then she coughed as she turned a frown at me, and I hurriedly clarified myself. I mean that my preliminary upgrades are working. I wasn't sure they'd hold up against whatever bullshit Permarks have. I believe that had more to do with Lady Celine's soul being empowered and detached from the warp. The so-called Primarch aura is a power of the soul, not of the body. Makes sense, I nodded. Well, that was boring. Wanna do some sparring and practice? Dal just grinned and Celan gave me a slightly apprehensive look I understood instantly as anxiety simmered in her aura. You need practice to get used to your growing psychic powers. Relying on the armor and the weapons I gave you is all good, but you are a psyker. You don't have to fear demons anymore, or even the corruption of the warp. She gave me a resolute nod. She probably felt her powers were almost insignificant compared to mine or Val's, but she was growing in power with every fight. I could practically feel her soul growing denser, brighter, and more powerful in my realm. Plus, I've also been rather lazy, barely practicing or brainstorming on new uses for my powers until I run headfirst into a wall I can't just plow through. As I'd already known, I needed to diversify my toolset and expand my versatility. That included not only the templates I worked out and my forms, but my psychic powers. It was time to do some research and development. Then maybe some friendly sparring. Dal would be an interesting opponent and one that could probably push me to improve, especially if I limited myself to psychic powers. And Celine, well, I'd do my best to help her. Though I had some ulterior motives. Who knew what had happened once I kicked Val out of the sparring room, leaving the two of us alone? Hmm. Yes. Who knew where that could lead? But first. Work. 109. Training. The following couple of days turned out to be surprisingly calm. Or boring, depending on who you asked. I spent the large majority of it attempting to beat Valineth Black and Blue, while limiting my power output to the same level he was at. Emphasis on attempting. The newly ascended Eldar might have some of his screws a bit looser than before, but he was by no means worse for it. Maybe a bit of madness was what pushed him to even greater heights. I admit I'd thought he was a bit of a one-trick pony throwing devastating lightning bolts out of the sky like some budget store Zeus, but he showed me during our first spar that he could do far more than that. He just preferred the lightning because it was long-range, blindingly fast, and absolutely devastating. He unveiled more and more tricks as I pushed him further and further. Whenever I came up with a counter to one of his tricks, he pulled a new one out of his ass and beat me into the dirt with it. Case in point, right fucking now. Another miss, he intoned gleefully, his voice echoing in the wasteland for a hundred mouths curving into a smirk. Where am I? Find me. Find me. 
There were hundreds of him, each damned clone a tangible illusion that somehow radiated the exact same aura as all the rest. If I didn't know only one was real, I would have thought he'd split his soul among them. They had the same scent, same pattern of movement, same weight, same everything. He was teaching me, in his own weird way. I'd told him I sort of messed up my infiltration because my illusions couldn't hold up to the scrutiny of the Imperium's elite. Ever since then, he'd been using more and more elaborate illusions in our spars and making me figure out what he was doing. The back of my neck tingled and my arm snapped out before my mind could catch up with it. Power coated it and my palm slapped away a bolt of devastation, sending it out into the distance where it carved a 20-meter-long gash into the ground. That was one of his quick bolts as he called them. Low power, maximum speed. Not that even an Astartes could walk one of these off if it caught them in the chest. Every miss on my part would result in him trying to zap me with one of those bad boys. Now, if I didn't limit myself to only using the same amount of power as him, I would probably send a blast of energy in all directions and see what happened. Or split myself into a hundred drones and bed each one up, one on one. There were other options too especially since Gilliman thankfully kept up his part of the bargain and I had another 50 exotic templates in my arsenal. Some were still being digested, but there was a frog thing from Catacan that tended to explode when scared with enough power to make nuclear warheads blush. That one was the first I rushed to complete. So I had nukes now. Doing any of that would be admitting defeat though, showing I was incapable of outsmarting Valeneth. Nope. I'd rather spend the next day here getting zapped while my mind course worked on a solution. That was another problem I only recently found out. The mind cores tended to be rather uncreative, leaving the innovation part of most things to me. They could take scraps of ideas and turn them into diamonds, but I had to provide the scraps. That was both comforting to know and an annoying limitation. So, how does one find the single real slippery Eldar in a crowd of fakes? Time is ticking, mistress. He was basically purring now, what the hell? And who are you calling mistress? Though it has a nice chime to it, hmm. A tiny mental zap from the mind core dedicated to keeping my wandering thoughts aimed at my goal rushed through my brain. Right. Focus. Every clone made the same sounds as they moved, each breathed in the same pattern, each had the same heartbeat, same scent, same fucking everything. Even opening my third eye proved useless since Val's immaterial soul was locked in space inside my forest realm. Out in real space though? It was as if his soul was really split into a hundred equal parts, even though I knew that should be impossible. Well, not impossible, but doing so tended to fracture the psyche irreparably and was the worst form of torturous agony imaginable. So he was faking it, somehow. That was what I had to figure out, there had to be a tell some inconsistency between the fakes and the real deal. He probably only split the soul energy held in his body among the clones, not his actual soul. Hmm, the split energy would be then used up to maintain both the illusions and the fake aura thing. I slapped away another impatient bolt and ignored the grumbling space elf. That would mean, with time, the clone's aura should diminish as the imbued energy is used up. Shouldn't it? So why isn't that happening? We had been at it for two hours now, and I refused to believe the spell he used was so damned efficient that I couldn't feel the dimming soul energy in them. He had to be maintaining them, continuously, channeling power to the clones, constantly, to keep their auras level. How though? I felt no threads of energy crisscrossing the air, no web of power connecting all the clones. They all felt like entirely separate, autonomous constructs. With a flick of my hand, I had one of the clones tumbling towards me, and my fingers clamped down around its dainty neck as it reached me. I squinted at it. Where are you getting energy from? The clone grinned, my danger sense screamed, and I only had a moment to pull a shield up between me and the construct before it exploded into a tiny thunderstorm. Arcs of lightning crawled on my shield, finding purchase, digging in while some others rushed around it. I jumped back and pulled up another while sending a wave of what Val called dispersing energy. As the wave met the annoying arcs of lightning, parts of both annihilated each other. The wave stopped, spreading into a tiny cloud as it ate up the remaining lightning, losing parts of its density with each absorption. So he wasn't going to let me dissect a clone. Annoying, but predictable. 
that was exactly what I would have done, what I had done with my own clones and drones. Though mine was more of a normal explosion, not whatever this thundercloud thing he had going on was. Was I overthinking things? Even with the power I was limiting myself to, with Val's power being spread equally between the clones and none of them making actual moves aside from counterattacking when I hit them, I should be capable of destroying a large number of them. Would he remake some clones? That would give me a better chance to catch how he channels his power so stealthily. Or he would just up and stop playing, channeling the freed up energy into the rest of the clones, before making them swarm me. Plus, that would sort of be like I'm admitting defeat. Or that I'm a brutish muscle head, the horror. Nope, we can't have that. I'm a space wizard now. Targeting another clone, I sent a bolt of lightning its way. The clone only gave a token effort of dodging and putting up a shield, but the lightning arced through the air, zigzagging around the shield and twisting towards the clone's new position before hitting home. The clone froze up with no apparent damage as the lightning seeped into it. Follow the energy. That was my command to it, and that was what it did. Swimming against the current of soul energy in the construct. Come on, come on. I focused on guiding the arcs of energy. This spell was a weird mix of just willing lightning into being and shoving a bunch of commands into it. It was half will cast warp bullshit and half practical commands not too dissimilar from lines of code. It was a new way of using my psychic power, though only to me. Val treated it as a matter of fact that this was the most efficient way of doing it. One part made sure the result wouldn't be constrained by real space too much and the other gave it direction and versatility beyond, go that way and explode. Anyway, it was working, sort of. It found some sort of energy current in the clone, but I could tell Val was slowly getting control back over the paralyzed clone. Sending another bolt would disrupt the previous one and diverting energy from following the currents would be counterproductive. Instead, I let loose another dozen bolts into random clones. Divide and conquer, was it? Well, the only thing I was dividing here would be Val's focus, and I had no intention of doing any conquering of Val. Celine would have been unhappy with that, I think. It worked, kinda. His attention was now spread between the dozen clones, but he still focused on the first one the most since I assumed the spell was already getting close to reaching his secret. Plus, he was much faster in the other clones, probably because all the spells acted the same and he already devised the perfect counter to it. Alright, let's mix it up then. I added some randomization into the code so every bolt from now on would act a bit differently. These things cost quite some energy, so I would only have enough power to shoot off another 50, without breaking the rules of this training. I went with 20 for now, aimed at clones all around, and Val's focus noticeably veined, his resistance faltering in the previous clones. Though the first one managed to self-destruct. Need to make the paralyzation a bit stronger. That would make the spells even more costly. I waited for a minute, tracking how deep my spells were penetrating and making modifications to the last batch I could shoot off. They would be the last and if they didn't hit Val, the real Val, I would officially lose this bout. After another minute, I sent off the last ten bolts, made even more expensive by the modifications I'd made, and sat back. I'd be a bit exhausted were this really my limit, but I felt nothing as I crossed my legs and followed the many arcs of electricity burrow into the clones. Either way, psychic powers were quite unlike any sort of magic described in most stories back on Earth. My body didn't store the energy, it was just a conduit and the only limiting factor on how much energy I could bring to bear. If I was connected to the near-infinite warp that is, and not a tiny puddle, not that I would change anything. I rather liked my mind unmolested by demons, and my soul unpossessed. Eating up the entirety of my little puddle in a fight would be disastrous, possibly sending all the souls I held in my realm falling back into the warp. I wanted to be done with this ball excursion in the near future. It was well past time I found myself a real place to settle down and expand from. I needed that damned farm that would replenish the bioenergy I needed and I also had to find a way to replenish my soul energy without opening a damned gateway between literal hell and my soul, that can't be healthy. With four psychers constantly draining my puddle, it was noticeably dimming. It would hold for a few years at the pace it was losing density, but I wanted it as robust as possible. Finally, finally, one spell struck home. 
It found the end of the current and disappeared from my senses. Hmm, I squinted. I held a faint connection to it even after it disappeared for a few moments. Then it was gone for good. What sort of tomfoolery is this? Another one dimmed, but this time I latched onto the connection and strengthened the spell with as much energy as I should be reasonably able to draw on after two minutes of resting. It held for three seconds this time. Not a total waste, though. I had an idea of what he was doing. Damn cheat. That's why I couldn't find his main body among the horde of clones, it wasn't even here. I don't know if he somehow made a tiny pocket space or is just on the other side of the planet. I frowned. My third eye popped open, and I let it take in ball. Gilliman, Mephiston, Dante, and the farcer were hard to miss, and Val should have been the same, but there was no trace of his soul. Pocket space it was. The problem was, I couldn't make them and had only the faintest idea of how they worked. It was ancient Eldari bullshit and Val said it needed a delicate touch and a clear mind. By which he clearly meant I should get good before asking for that sort of stuff again. How do I crack open that dimensional egg he probably hid himself in? And where is it even? Shouldn't a damned spatial distortion be apparent in my aura when I felt even the ripples a warp jump made? There were no easy answers forthcoming. My aura was spread over all the clones, but there was no sign of as much as a ripple in space, not even a tiny bump. Obviously, he wouldn't place his hidey hole in the place where he knew we would be fighting. If our roles were switched, I would be commanding those clones from one of the damned moons. With my aura reaching a kilometer in radius when I pushed it to the limit, I had no hope of finding him without tracking the energy back to him. Time ticked. Spell after spell disappeared and I tried to follow them to no avail. He was using some sort of microscopic portals to channel his energy anchored to the clones I assumed, though they were so stable and flawless that I couldn't sense them with my aura. Another shortfall, that would need to be fixed. The damned list was ever growing. Then the last active spell disappeared, and a moment later, my connection to it snapped. Based on the rules, I was out of energy. With all my spells gone. I had lost. Again. Damn it. A portal opened up before me, and the annoying Eldar strode out of it. That was great progress, mistress. He grinned easily, no sign of his usual unbearably arrogant smirk. I believe you might win our next bout. How did you do that? I asked with a frown. The thing where the clones mimicked your aura? The mystery of why I couldn't feel his real soul beneath seemed to be that it just wasn't here, but the aura mimicry could be handy. It is a complicated technique, he shrugged. Though one needs to perfectly understand their own aura and sink into its depths to even have a chance of doing so. This takes centuries of targeted meditation for the Eldari to accomplish, though I'm certain you will manage in a few decades. Right, I sighed. Well, I guess that's it for today. It indeed is, he nodded. Same time tomorrow? I suppose, I said. Good night, Val. To you too, mistress. 110, Kleptomaniac. I arrived back to our shared room with Celine, still in a bit of a sour mood. I learned, advanced, and became better today. That wasn't a question. But I also lost, which was grating to a primal part of me. Better to lose against allies in spars and training, than against enemies. I reassured myself, but the sour taste in my mouth remained. I opened the door with a bit of TK, and stopped. Celine sat with her legs crossed on the bed, dressed only in her night clothes, and with her eyes only now cracking open. She blinked at me. Comfort me. I threw myself at her, and she fell back onto the bed with a yelp as I snuggled into the hug. You are, a sigh reverberated through her chest, then her arms wrapped around me comfortingly. Did Val beat you up again? He did not. I protested, though not too strongly. Then whispered. Maybe a little. You poor thing, she said, her melodic voice tinged with affectionate sarcasm. How will you recover from this? Her fingers slowly started playing with my hair and running along my scalp, sending nice little tingles down my spine. I rolled away, then placed my head on her lap to let her work her magic on my nerves, which she did with a smile as I settled in. I don't think I ever will, I hummed. Though this certainly helps. 
I can imagine, she smirked. I did not know where she learned it, but I suspected she was using space magic with her fingers, despite me not feeling even a hint of energy from them. They were just divine. Anything interesting happened today? With our blue friends, you mean? I asked as I closed my eyes to enjoy the scalp massage. And the rest, she said. Things have been in a bit of a lull lately. Yeah, I agreed. Not that I mind. Gilliman is playing cat and mouse with the remaining Tyranids, and the reverse with whatever's down in the tunnels. I heard scouts have a 50-50 chance of returning from the depths. Nothing too interesting. Things have been rather hectic ever since you arrived on that hive world, so this bit of peace is nice. Right. I could practically hear her eyes roll. And you lived peacefully and in harmony with nature right up to the moment I arrived on Fallax 4. If you count the occasional mutant nature, along with a lictor. And you murdering them and eating their corpses as harmony. Nature is savage. I gave a little shrug. They should have been stronger if they didn't want to get eaten. That is, she started, her fingers stopping. How do humans measure into that philosophy? I mean, I said. The same applies, but I won't get anything from eating humans aside from some bioenergy. So if they are being a pain in my ass, I'm not going to eat or kill them. You know that's a very, ambiguous rule to live by. It isn't really a rule, per se. I just do what I like. Rules, she whispered. Her fingers resumed their work. Would you be opposed to establishing some ground rules for yourself? I think that could help with your, problem. Huh. Meaning my stupidly malleable soul and personality. I guess it would. Any ideas? No eating civilians? She asked, though I could tell she didn't expect me to accept it. She was treating this like haggling, starting with a price far above what she wanted. If they don't have any powers or traits, I want and they aren't in the way of murdering soldiers or other people I want to kill, I said. I refuse to limit myself to avoiding collateral damage. That would be crippling in this galaxy, especially since the Imperium would be more than willing to use its own civilians as hostages if they figured out I wouldn't kill them. That's fair, she said. And I don't expect you to limit yourself. Killing with a goal, can be, understandable. But I think senseless slaughter and the sort would be dangerous for you. That taints even the most virtuous humans. Even normal killing does, I murmured, trying to imagine how being in the Imperial Guard would change the average 21st century teen. They would either break or bend, adding to the suicide rates of the Guard or becoming like them, desensitized, broken tools to be wielded by their commanders. I suspected my Earth self would have been among the first. I wasn't good with pressure back then, at all. You know what I mean, she huffed. Killing for the goal of killing, or for pleasure. That's the sort of twisted thing I'd imagine a Drakari doing. Yeah. With the strength of my soul being as it is, becoming as depraved as those Slaneshi degenerates would probably have rather disastrous consequences. All right, I said. Rule 1, always ask myself whether killing a person has any reasonable goal behind it and never go through with it if it doesn't. Would getting more bioenergy be a reasonable goal? Not if I'm not starving, I shrugged. I believed I would have acted according to this rule already without stating it out loud, but putting it into words might make that more permanent. I suppose that's good, Celine said. Then added softly. Yes. That is already better than the rules most commissars and generals live by. Not much of a challenge, I said. It really isn't, she said regretfully, then shook her head. Any other ideas for rules? That was about all I had in mind. I suppose I should extend rule one into other things aside from killing. I am more than capable of making people regret ever being born without killing them. So you want to include pointless cruelty? Something of the sort would probably be worthwhile to establish, though I can't say where I'd draw the line, I said. I might have enjoyed seeing those cultists I experimented on screaming in agony a bit more than I was supposed to. If you need an outlet, better them than someone unworthy of that agony. I suppose, I said thoughtfully. Though these things tend to spiral out of control. Do they? 
Where I come from there had been studies, I said. Like, people exhibiting cruelty in childhood, as in killing and torturing pets and animals, are more likely to act with cruelty against their fellow men later in life. I, can't say I would feel sorry for cultists and the sort even if you tortured them for days, she said, once again showcasing the inherent difference between 21st century people and someone accustomed to the Imperium's way of life. But I see your point. Do you want some threshold or some such? So you don't sink into excess? Yep, I said. Excess of anything is a dangerous thing in this galaxy. That it is, she murmured. If you put any sort of limit on indulging, that should be enough. Right? Maybe? I said. There aren't any studies around there looking into what counts as excess when it comes to that horny demon, but I assume it's always relative to the person themselves. That does make sense, she agreed. That limit should be something for you to decide on. Hmm, I frowned and thought. Well, let's say. If there is no goal to torturing someone. I have to put them out of their misery after an hour at most? Without a goal? She raised an eyebrow, judging. I mean, for information and stuff? You can read minds, dear, she admonished. There is no use torturing anyone for information for you. I think the way I do it counts as torture, I said, though I agreed with her. Thinking on it. Was there anything I could gain by just inflicting pain on anyone aside from maybe some sick sense of satisfaction at giving pain back to the ones who usually spread it? I couldn't think of anything. So? Celine asked. I suppose. I shouldn't torture them? I said uncertainly. If what you said about what happens to souls after death is true, she said. Everyone you kill has a fate far worse ahead of them than you torturing them for a few weeks. True ee -e, I murmured, blinking sleepily. I didn't need sleep, sure, but massages had a way of relaxing my mind along with my body. Especially when done by the cutie I had for a lover. That's rule two then, no torturing people. The sigh Celine let out was filled with relief. She gently slid one palm down and caressed my cheek with her fingers. Thank you. I... I leaned into her hand, much like a cat asking for scratches. I know, and thank you. I gave her an affectionate smile. She was worried, I could feel it clearly, worried for me. There might have been personal preferences involved in her wanting me to establish these rules, especially in the no senseless murdering of civilians part, but she was mostly worried about me turning into something she couldn't recognize as me. It was nice, to feel someone cared and I cared just as much about remaining myself, if not more, than her. I was just, weak? I don't know how to describe it, but I doubt I would have ever given myself iron-hard rules to operate under if I didn't have her pushing me to do it. This would be good for me. With that thought, I felt two obelisks form in my mindscape and settle on a close orbit around the central pyramid of my mind. Two obelisks, with the two rules inscribed onto them to forever remind me of the promises I'd made today and would hold myself to. Maybe more would join these two in the future, but the baseline had been established. With time, the rules would become a part of who I was. Intellectually, I understood becoming someone who lived by these rules and not just obeyed them would be a positive change. Even if some primal, Beastly side of me felt revolted by the mere idea of conforming to rules and not indulging my base nature. Stupid instincts. They mostly worked well and in my favor. Other times, they were a weakness. No matter how much that brain dead, murder robo instinct felt shackled by these rules, the pragmatic part of me could tell these instincts would be a much more dangerous thing to indulge than some rules, making me show some basic human decency. Or whatever I am now decency. I should tease what the actual name of what I am is from that stone-faced custodian. What are you thinking about? Celine asked curiously, probably feeling my need to end the previous topic. Small steps. How I still don't have a name for what I am, I said. I could maybe get the official name the Imperium had for the thing that makes up my body, but I am not just my body. It's like calling you a chunk of coal, because you are made of mostly carbon. You are unique, aren't you? she asked. That means you have to come up with your own name. Name, I snorted. I guess I am just a kidna, then. 
that fits. Does it mean something? Echidna was a monster in an ancient mythology on Earth. A half-snake, half-woman, born to two deities. They called her the mother of monsters for she birthed some of the most dangerous monstrosities of the ancient mythology. That fits, she said with an amused lilt. You chose it because of that, didn't you? Yep, I nodded. Though it was funny at the time. How I proclaimed myself to be a maker of monsters right in front of an imperial captain and she couldn't tell because her own imperium buried history. I can see the irony in there, she huffed. Though I don't appreciate being the captain in question. Did I mention how beautiful the captain was? I batted my eyes up at her. How her sweet voice tamed the vicious alien from the distant past. She rolled her eyes, then flicked my forehead playfully. Silly alien. I need more taming now, I whined. Get back to work, please. Truly the terror of the Milky Way, she sighed, but her fingers went back to playing along my scalp. I can't believe how the Imperium isn't trembling in fear already. Me neither, I mumbled, mouth quirking into a smirk. I'm terrifying. That you are, she said fondly. I can't help but tremble in fear in your presence. As it should be, I huffed in faux arrogance, pulling on my inner, young mistress. Only your divine massages save you from my wrath, human. Oh, I know more thorough massages your alienness, she purred. A full body experience. It will refresh you both inside and out. I opened my mouth to reply, her husky voice doing all the things to my body she wished them to do and more, but I froze. Celine noticed immediately, her fingers stopping as she looked down at me with a serious frown. Something happened? Is everything all right? I worked my jaw, then gave a slow nod as I reinforced my connection to the avatar. Yes, everything is fine. But? Slowly, my mouth stretched into a wide grin. I'd controlled dozens of drones at once, having experienced splitting my attention between multiple bodies. But avatars were different. They connected right into my soul, while drones only connected to the avatar. So when my one avatar suddenly became two, it threw me for a loop. More than fine, I jumped up, giggling. Oh, this is going to be interesting. While one avatar picked Selene up and spun her around in Gleon Ball, the other avatar was halfway across the galaxy, deep underground on a planet of metal and machinery from before time. Salamace. My eyes cracked open as I reinforced the connection that had just been re-established after weeks of inactivity. Sickly green serpents of energy coiled around my body, locking my limbs in place, coiling around every inch of my body, and suppressing even my supernatural strength with ease. My gaze landed on the soul form aside from me in the dark underground room, illuminated only by the faint light of my technomagical shackles. He was a man of metal, large staff held in hand, with a hood behind a face covered by a smirking death mask. Even if I didn't know who he was from the place I found myself in or didn't suspect him already of running off with my avatar, I would have recognized him in a moment. Soul energy surged in my body, unable to escape it, but easily sinking into my flesh and lacing my vocal cords with unnatural power. Trazen, the one they call the infinite. What an unexpected surprise. 111, Tor. I didn't expect the prehistoric space robot to gasp in surprise or stumble at me having known who he was, but I couldn't help but be disappointed when he just continued staring at me with those lifeless green eyes of his. Curious, he murmured, speaking in low Gothic. He tapped a floating screen in front of him. Annoying tin bucket, you kidnap me, then act like I'm just a fancy piece of furniture. I decided to see how strong his fancy containment field was, so I pulled on some soul energy and pushed. The green energy wobbled, forced back away from my skin, before snapping back as I let up. Hum, hum, that was just a gentle push. I might be able to force my way out of this, making a tiny hole and teleporting through should be more than doable. Though it might just result in me getting thrown back into his pokeball, before I could do so. At least it got his attention. I grinned as he dropped the floating window, which turned out to be some glass tablet, he near frantically fiddled with some switches, and then I felt the green coiling energy constrict around me and gain in power. What is it? Celine asked my other avatar which was still happily bouncing around. 
what happened? I regained connection to my kidnapped avatar, I said. Let's hope he doesn't put it back into the box. I shouldn't scare him too much. What did he do, she asked. He isn't dissecting you or something, is he? Nope, I said. He just has me tied up in a spread eagle, like some wall decoration. Celine just stared at me, frowning. Then a flush ran up her cheeks. Naughty, I rolled my eyes. Ah. Uh, I might be a bit distracted for a bit. Feel free to jolt me awake if there is something. Sleep well. I guess? With that said, I flopped over the bed and returned my focus to the avatar in Trazen's BDSM dungeon. I would appreciate it if you refrained from repeating that, he said stoically. I would hate to be forced to return you into the Tesseract Labyrinth after just a few minutes. That would be regrettable indeed, I nodded, doing away with the empowered voice thing. You could certainly work on your hospitality though. It is an unfortunate consequence of our circumstances, he said. Hmm, I squinted at him. Stupid evasive rust bucket. Why did you kidnap me? I have never seen anything quite like you, he said after a moment of consideration. It would be a shame if a unique being like yourself was lost to time. Here, you will exist in perpetuity as a part of my, museum. I know of your infinite galleries, Overlord Trazen, I said. No need to dance around the subject. A welcome surprise. The 60-million-year-old alien murder robot preened like a cat. I would offer to give you a tour, alas, I have learned not to let dangerous people near my prized exhibits. I don't suppose I could convince you to reconsider? I asked. Believe it or not, I am quite interested in your museum. I'm afraid it would be too much of a risk, he said, tapping a metal finger on his chin. I can hardly even figure out what manner of a creature you are. Though if you could enlighten me. I might be able to craft a containment with which I would be comfortable letting you take a stroll through the less important exhibits. That's a tough question, I hummed. You see, I'm not quite sure myself. Nor am I willing to disclose all of my weaknesses to you. What I will tell you, is what you have here tied up is what I call an avatar, and I have more than one of them running around. That would complicate things, he said with a nod. I suppose, seeing as how agreeable you've been so far, you are not hellbent on delivering some misguided revenge on me for having misappropriated your avatar. Or are you? I do have some simmering resentment, I admit, I said with a grin. Which wasn't helped by waking up naked and tied up in a basement. I waited a moment before continuing. That said, it is as you say. I'm sure we could come to an agreement. I wouldn't even be opposed to you keeping this avatar around for an exhibit if you compensated me for the loss. Avatars are energy-intensive and taxing to create. Or so you say, he hummed. Alas, I have indeed treated you like one of the narrow-minded humans. You have my apologies for that, whoever you may be. He actually apologized, and even sounded sincere, from what I could tell. Those stuck-up mops in the Imperium could learn a thing or two from this old Necron. What a weird galaxy, the crazy space skeleton is more respectful than the humans. Echidna, I said. I might not know what I am, but I do have a name. Well met, he said in that creepy buzzing voice of his. Echidna. Before anything else, I shifted my body around a bit. I wasn't too embarrassed being naked in front of a Necron, but it wasn't a good look. I covered my skin in nice white scales I took from some lizard and removed the erotic bits from my body. Trazen stared at me in fascination, which was making me feel kinda weirded out. I gave a mental sigh. Another damned negotiation. In the end, it took almost an hour and some testing from the old collector's part until I was semi-freed from my bondage. I might have zoned out midway through and just went to autopilot. Wait Tevs. I stretched my newly made very fragile human drone, which was controlled by the still tightly tied up avatar floating up above. Trazen was still running some scans over the drone, to make sure I hadn't snuck a nuclear bomb into it or something, I hadn't, and then I would get a tour of the place with the possibility of further trade down the line. I could tell the archivist was interested in my ability to perfectly replicate biological organisms just from a sample, 
but he made no offers for doing some reconstructions on his somewhat crashed exhibitions. Likewise, I didn't bring up taking a bit out of some of his prized exhibits, yet. It does seem to be an entirely normal human female, he said thoughtfully. The signs of brain activity seem strange, but I suppose that is understandable. As discussed, the moment I sense any foul movements from you, your avatar is getting locked in a tesseract labyrinth. Yes, yes, I shrugged. I had a pretty good idea where exactly Salamace was in the galaxy by now. If Trazen locked me away or was an asshole, I was going to pay him an explosive visit in a few weeks. Plus, I was about 60% sure I could force my way out of the containment before he could react. Though he might just throw one of his pet ancient horrors at me if I did so. The ensuing battle would surely ruin quite a few of his exhibits and sour our following relationship, which I didn't want at the moment. Let us begin then, he said, striding forward and motioning for me to follow, which I did. It has been a while since I had a receptive audience. I hummed noncommittally. Truth be told, I was getting excited. I did enjoy museum visits even back on Earth and I was just about to see the greatest museum of this galaxy with stuff older than any civilization I knew back then. Plus, Trazen was going to guide me through it. I never got into the painting miniatures part of the hobby, but my shelf did sport a tiny replica of the old archivist in his full glory. Even if it was pre-painted, don't blame me, I had the artistic skill of a drunk monkey, and I probably still do. He led me through winding tunnels, and up a few elevators. With a masterful application of willpower and a show of unparalleled self-control, I didn't start humming some elevator tune as we stood in silence. Just how damn deep was that basement dungeon he keeps me locked up in? I wondered. After a few eternal minutes spent in silence, the door opened up in front of us and I saw a well-decorated hallway expand before me. If I didn't know I was in space, I could have mistaken the place for the insides of the Louvre or the British Museum. Paintings, statues, and smaller art pieces stood by the walls, placed at equal distances from each other and as if to stand guard at the sides of the occasional large archways opening up to other rooms. Trazen had items out here that would have been worth building museums of their own around. I would have thought he was disrespecting the ancient art pieces, but I knew the main attractions were his prized prismatic galleries. Holographic displays recapturing events from history deemed worthy of preservation. These galleries were not populated by mere sculptures, but by conscious living beings, transmuted into the holograph themselves. I supposed my fate would have been something similar, or more along the lines of placed into simple time stasis and put out on a pedestal like a living statue. How nostalgic, I said. It reminds me of ancient museums on ear, cough, I mean holy terra. Is that so? He sounded pleased. This section is dedicated to early human relics I've managed to rescue. Since I myself haven't been able to see early human architecture, I could only work off of hearsay and ruins to design the decor. I believe you did quite well at it, I said, only to stop and gape at a particular painting. I didn't know whether to laugh or be horrified. Trazen noticed me stopping and turned to stare at me curiously as I stepped up to the tiny frame and the painting inside. I ignored him in favor of inspecting the painting. It was frozen in time, I could feel the spatial disturbance of the stasis field even in this basic human body. Following a few seconds of stupefaction, I let out a snort. Back when I was a teenager on Earth, I somehow got into a tour that took me on a month-long journey around Western Europe with other kids. Amsterdam, Brussels, Paris, London, and Vienna were the main stops and despite only having spent a few days in each capital, I remembered staring at this exact same painting in the Louvre. This crazy fucker had the Mona Lisa out in the hallway like it was some kid's scribbles. The hallway expanded into the distance, splitting just a few hundred meters away, and I could see at least another fifty paintings and dozens of statues placed with about the same care as the most famous painting on earth, in my time that is. Then I remembered a little tidbit from the lore and broke out in cackles. How did you get this? I asked him. Ah, sorry for being so forward. But I was under the impression that this. I pointed at the painting. Was one of the most prized possessions of Malkador, the Sigilite. Ah, I see, he nodded. I wasn't aware of its origins unfortunately, it was part of some imperial governor's collection along with most of the other paintings you see in this hallway. I shook my head ruefully. 
I'm not sure if you can check for the authenticity of a painting, or for its age. But if this is the original, then it is more than 40,000 years old. That seemed to stump the old Necron. Truly? He walked up to it, gently motioning for me to move aside, which I did. He then took out a slew of scanners from God knows where and waved them around for a minute. The stasis field messes with temporal signatures, so I cannot be sure until I run some detailed scans, but it does indeed seem to be around 35 to 40 millennium old. Do you perhaps have a painting depicting sunflowers that came from the same governor's museum? Sunflowers? He asked back, distractedly. I'm afraid I am unaware of that particular species of flora. Well, I said. They are large flower-like plants with yellow leaves. I stopped, realizing how little that narrowed down the options. The painting I'm curious about supposedly depicted a handful of the flowers in a vase, with a somewhat, eccentric style. I could have thrown up an illusory replica of the painting quite easily, but locked in this flimsy body as I was and without drawing on any soul energy, all I could do was use words to describe it and consequently make a fool of myself. I wasn't an art girl, all right? Nor did I know how to describe damned plants accurately. You didn't need to be either to just enjoy art and nature though. Perhaps, he said. I just might. But if I may, why do you ask? It was the only other piece of art the sigillite managed to protect from the ravages of time, aside from this one. I nodded toward the damned Mona Lisa. Both of them should be a relic from the second millennium of Holy Terra. I see, he nodded. Well, I suppose I will just plan our tour so we walk by all the possible candidates for that painting. Thank you, I said. Would you care to share what you know of these two paintings? He asked after a moment. I would be loath to not have the original artist's name under them at the very least. Sure, I smiled and started to enlighten Trazen about the Renaissance and the lives of Leonardo da Vinci and Vincent van Gogh. 112 goodies. Unfortunately, this one seems to be a replica from around the early 21st millennium. Trazen lamented, staring up at a convincing remake of Michelangelo's David. I suspected as much, I said. Humans bombed themselves back into the Bronze Age during the Age of Technology. Such is the nature of those constrained to the present. I suppose it is, I said with a shrug. I wasn't going to tell the space skeleton that living in the past wasn't the best either especially since it resulted in him being quite possibly the most agreeable Necron in the galaxy. I'm surprised it took them so long though. And even more surprised that they survived it at all. How so, he asked, suddenly curious, and the statue forgotten. Many civilizations last many millennia before some cataclysm or another puts an end to them. Humans could have wiped themselves out by the end of the 20th century, I shrugged. The fact they somehow only advanced and rose up until the 20th millennium is a miracle greater than whatever the emperor can call down. Trazen hummed in agreement. It is unfortunate how many civilizations disappear, destroyed by their very own actions, throughout the galaxy on a regular basis. Do you have exhibits of some of those civilizations? I asked curiously. Those who just appeared and disappeared from the galaxy, unknown to the galaxy at large? There are some, he nodded. Though I admit few were deemed worth the effort of immortalizing in my galleries. On one hand, being selective with what history should be remembered rubbed the 21st century girl the wrong way, almost as much as the idea of letting civilizations and their memories fade into obscurity, but I also knew how much of a hassle it would be to keep an eye out for every self-destructive little shithole in the galaxy and make sure to collect some artifacts from there before they inevitably faced oblivion. Trazen was still alert, his green gaze never leaving me for too long, and even if it did, I could hear small mechanical spiders scuttling around in each room watching me. He had nothing to fear from me personally, the bastard was probably almost as slippery as I was when it came down to it with his surrogate bodies. He was basically a super lich, without the need for a phylactery and capable of possessing any necron bodies whose mental cortexes he could easily overwhelm with his own mind. I suspected the only thing he had to fear from me was to suddenly go on a rampage and damage his prized artifacts. Especially since he used that overpowered spear as a walking stick. 
The empathic obliterator, a weapon that could destroy armies with a swing, was reduced to a walking stick. The old ones would weep at the sight if they weren't all too dead to care. I'd be interested in seeing some if you don't mind? I asked, feeling a bit stumped at how genuine I was being with a cranky, old space skeleton. Oh well, there was little I had to hide from Trazen, and most of his sensibilities were things I agreed with, aside from whatever drove him to kidnap me. That was dumb, though welcome in hindsight. I suppose we could take a route in their direction, he nodded, though his green burning gaze stared at me with a measure of suspicion. What is in those exhibits you want, beautiful and unknowable stranger, was written on his, aura, since he lacked a facial expression. Though I doubted he used those exact same words in his mind. From there, he led me through a slew of smaller and larger exhibits. We made our way through the few he had of ancient Terra, with me barely managing to hold back a snicker as he regaled me with the tale of how he got his hands on a piece of silver machinery from the Admech priests at great cost to himself. How it must have had some religious importance to that subsect of the priesthood of Mars, and some such. How hard they fought to keep it and how old the damned thing was. In short, it was a toaster. An honest-to-God, old, Soviet-style toaster, with its large bulkiness and simplicity. I wouldn't have been surprised if the thing turned on the moment I plugged it in even after 40,000 years. From there we entered the weirder parts, with strange alien architecture, taking the place of the previous Roman and early Gothic architecture. He had fossilized remains of strange aliens, plants, statues, and other knickknacks of dubious origin and functionality. I took everything in like an overeager schoolgirl on her first school trip to the National Museum. I was in a space museum the size of a planet, built with nanomachines by a cranky skeleton. He'd be an uploaded person in a regular sci fi setting, wouldn't he? Biotransference is just basically creating an artificial mind based on your biological brain and then shoving it into a mechanical body. Hmm. He had so much interesting stuff. I was pleasantly surprised that I could still appreciate art and historical artifacts even without them having something to give me. Sure, there was the occasional time-frozen animal with descriptions that made me tempted to just take a little nibble. I held myself back since I was enjoying this little excursion. I wasn't going to ruin it by taking something I could get either way later. Plus, I had some ideas for Trazen, and maybe a possibly mutually beneficial partnership. We didn't find Van Gogh's sunflowers in the end, didn't we? Shame. It might be out there somewhere, but I didn't hold out much hope. Which meant the last piece of art from my time was the Mona Lisa now hanging from Trazen's walls. I wasn't sure how to feel about that but it'd surely beat having it in some governor's collection. If you don't mind me asking, Trazen interrupted my brooding. While I myself know the value of remembering history and respecting its ancient artifacts, few share my view. Even among my own kind. I couldn't help but be curious about what drove you to be. I suppose culture? I shrugged. Where I grew up destroying ancient artifacts was seen as a deplorable act. To forget ones, or others, history is to refuse to learn from the mistakes and triumphs of our ancestors. Anyone who vandalized historical artifacts was seen as a savage or a fanatic. A culture trait I wish was more prevalent in our galaxy, he gave an artificial sigh. I was under the misconception though, that you do not know what you are. I do not, I smiled. But I know what I was. We walked side by side now walking down a strange tunnel that slowly transformed from some natural design that appeared like vines were grown to cover the walls like wallpaper to normal dirt. If I didn't know where we were, I would have mistaken the place to be the entrance to the burrow of some large creature. You want to know what I was? I asked with a smirk. I do, he admitted. Though I was more wondering about the implications of your current state being artificial. I doubt it's replicable, I shrugged. The ones that did it are quite dead, the materials to do it are either unavailable or exhausted, and the catalyst even isn't likely to repeat itself ever again. If you are capable of what you claimed, one of you could be calamitous enough to most civilizations. True, I shrugged. I don't intend to make more of me, either. I quite like being a singularity. Let us backtrack, he said. You mentioned having been part of a larger culture before? I did, I said. 
though I'm afraid my kind and whatever culture we had has been warped into something unrecognizable and repugnant over the millennia. He just hummed and somehow managed to throw me a side-eye with those glowing green orbs of his. I was a human, I shrugged, deciding I had little to lose by admitting it. Back in the 21st century. That made him stumble and whirl around to stare at me, which was quite creepy, with the metallic death mask wearing that annoying smirk and sporting two unblinking eyes. There was a hunger in those unliving eyes, a hunger for knowledge that couldn't be satisfied even if one lived till the stars went dark. A human, he murmured, tilting his head as if trying to verify my claims. A human? Yes, I shrugged. Your culture might be the same as it had been millions of years ago, but mine is not. I do not find anything familiar in today's humanity, and nor do I particularly identify with anything they stand for. Understandably so, he nodded, recollecting himself and straightening up. That was quite the shock. The earliest humans I interacted with were already in the 31st millennium. I would be very interested in early human history. I'm sure we can come to an agreement, I said. You have quite a few things I would very much love to get my hands on. Do I now? He tapped his chin thoughtfully while staring at me. Am I right in presuming you are somehow aware of what I have in this gallery? I just know one or two unfortunate fellows who found themselves frozen in time and might be in here somewhere, I shrugged. Fellows, who I would very much love to, sample. Sample, is it, he hummed. Not take? Free? Kill? Not at all, I shrugged. Though if you have multiple and ones you would be willing to part with entirely, having the full body would be better, but it's not a must. I can gain the same thing from a single drop of blood. Do you fancy yourself a genealogist? He asked. Not quite, I smirked. I like variety in my diet, and I am something of a collector myself. If it really is just a drop of blood you need, that is hardly an issue on my part, he said, eyes narrowed as he seemed to be thinking deeply. I would have loved to know what he was thinking, what he thought I would do with some blood and such. Do you have anything in mind? I have quite a number of them, I smiled. Any alien biological sample from species or individuals with strange or interesting abilities is welcome, but I have a few specific ones in mind too. Do tell, he said, just as we entered the next room. It really looked like what I thought the insides of an anthill looked like. But instead of ants, horrendously ugly human-sized bug things dotted the exhibit here and there. I recognized them and grinned. Something like these, for example. I always wondered how their strange time manipulation worked. He hummed. The HRUD. I doubt it's biological in nature. Worth a try, I shrugged. Worth a try? It would be better to show it, I said. But we would need to take the sample back to my avatar, and you would have to let it, eat the sample. He seemed to be deep in thought. Counting the pros and cons of risking letting my avatar do some weird alien bullshit, no doubt. I had made creating this drone look like I just spat it out like a hairball. Which seemed to confuse the archivist to no end. I have refrained from asking about your more unique capabilities up until now for propriety's sake, he said. But I would like to ask why would you like to eat those samples, and what would happen if you did so? Nothing would happen, outwardly at least, I shrugged. Not if I didn't want anything to happen. I am capable of perfectly understanding the genetic makeup of creatures I can sample. An intriguing ability, he said. Would it be similar to what the crit are capable of, or would you liken it to the Tyranid's capability to reverse engineer genes? The latter, I said. It's controlled and instinctual. Crit eat whatever they stumble upon and hope for the best outcome. Tyranid's experiment with clear goals in mind. I suppose it couldn't hurt, he said after a few seconds. You would like a HRUD sample? Now that you mention it, I trailed off, glancing at the repulsive humanoid worm things. They had fist-sized pure black eyes on a chitinous head, devoid of a nose, or an ear with the mouth of a lamprey stuck in the middle. They had long worm-like legs and arms even longer, almost brushing the ground as they stood hunched over. These were the sort of things that would give nightmares not only to children, but seasoned guardsmen. Not that most survived long enough to have nightmares about them, 
The disgusting things had an aura-like ability that aged everything around them to death. Weapons short-circuited, rusted, and decomposed while the humans wielding them turned to thousand-year-old ash in the blink of an eye. Yes, I think these would do perfectly. I grinned. Ugly as they were, they had a broken ability which I really wanted to get my hands on. Maybe this would be the breakthrough I needed to understand how Mephiston manipulated time. 